good afternoon everybody and a very good morning to uh, to dr jimshed burucha who is a vice chancellor of sai university we also um, have with us mr nalin bakle who is joining us from canada we have the dean and we have the other staff and faculty members joining us and of course a very warm welcome again to the next session um, on day 1 it gives me immense pleasure to introduce dr jimshed burucha he is the vice chancellor of sai university he has worked uh, he has served as a distinguished fellow and a research professor at dartmouth college he has held several leadership positions at uh, very renowned universities in the us he has been the provost and senior vice president of the tufts university he his research area is the cognitive psychology and neuroscience which focused on the cognitive and neural basis of the perception of music he has also been the editor of the interdisciplinary journal music perception and was a fellow at the center for advanced study in the behavioral sciences at stanford with that i would uh, officially hand it on to you uh, dr burucha well thank you uh, neha and welcome everybody this is an historic day i think that years from now all of you students are going to look back and see just how pioneering you were to be the inaugural class of the daksha fellowship which by implication will be the inaugural class of sai university it's a real pleasure for me to be associated with sai even though i'm right now sitting on the other side of the earth uh, i talk about it to everybody uh, who will listen and even to those who won't listen that this is going to be a great university our goal is nothing short of true excellence true distinction and to be unique to be distinctive in our approach to education let me talk a little bit about what i mean by that first of all we want sai university to be a truly global university now a lot of people throw that word around global international and what i've noticed is that for indian universities it's the mous you know the number of mous they sign with foreign universities is somehow supposed to be a measure of how global it is that's not really a measure mous are just pieces of paper how global you are is really the kinds of interactions that our students and our faculty will have with their counterparts abroad it's really building your global cohort and building your global network and i can assure you of course the pandemic has uh, been a challenge will be a challenge but there's always a silver lining which is that now that everybody in the world is comfortable jumping onto video calls we are really going to work to find ways for students and faculty to interact with counterparts abroad online and uh nalin bakle who is our director of international affairs and is on this call is in toronto uh, working on your behalf to try to make that possible i will also be working on your behalf to try to make that possible we will be assembling a uh a visiting faculty it's already been assembled for the daksha fellowship something that your dean has done so brilliantly uh we will also be bringing in people internationally 
to serve as advisors and distinguished visiting faculty members so that your education really is a broadening of the mind, a liberation of the mind. I like to define education really as a liberation of the mind and I'll come back to that in a minute. Trends in global universities are many. Of course, study abroad programs have been around, semester abroad, but there are many, many other ways, even after the pandemic is behind us, to conduct visits to other countries as well as for uh, students and faculty from other countries to visit us. Many ways that are focused on specific projects. And I think that uh, if we can be unique in India, by developing project-based collaborations where students work together from different countries on a project or faculty, of course, work on a research project. That, that is a fairly common model. That's more meaningful than just the semester abroad when what tends to happen is the students from one country go to another country for a semester, but they sort of stick together. So we're really going to try to be original in this respect. The world is closely interconnected now. Of course, you all are in law, and it's Indian law. <clears throat> but I think our faculty would agree, Daksha faculty, that um, it can only help for there to be an exchange of ideas uh, across countries to understand other systems, how they work. India is a place where we can be proud to be launching a fellowship in law because it is the largest democracy in the world and I think today has a standing in the world as it never has had before. It has a very, very uh, reputable standing in the world as a country devoted to democratic values and procedures, to the rule of law, and to all of the other ideas that come with a great democracy. It's also a vibrant culture. It's a, uh, it, it's a, it's a vibrant economy. Uh, and of course, the pandemic has set the economy back a bit, but you know, if the freedoms are encouraged and if the kind of education our students are given is one geared not towards shoving facts down students' throats and getting them to mug up and then uh, memorize by rote, if we get rid of that model and instead lead in bringing in a model in which education is about liberating the mind to think for yourself, giving you the skills to assess information, to assess arguments, to critique ideas with evidence, with data, with perspective, to exchange ideas vigorously but respectfully, and to be able to communicate very, in a very nuanced way, effectively, and have the confidence to come up with new ideas. Those are the things that an education should produce. <clears throat> and that's the kind of pedagogy and education philosophy that I wish to bring to the uh, to Sai University. I think Sai University is poised, perhaps as no other university in India is poised, by being born during this global pandemic 
uh, of course all institutions are affected students having to learn online but I think it gives us an opportunity to launch our university with hybrid forms of teaching in mind where there are online uh, there's online teaching and then eventually residential but there will be more pandemics after this I, I assure you of that the public of health health uh, experts know that and the institutions that can adapt quickly are the ones who are going to be effective <clears throat> Sai University will be a comprehensive multi-stream university where we will have in addition to law we'll have a school of arts and sciences and we'll be launching that school with a first batch starting in 2021 an undergraduate program initially and then later masters PhD programs as well and the School of Liberal Arts undergraduate program will be one in which students have tremendous flexibility in choosing their major subject they wouldn't have to in fact declare what they want to study when they're admitted the idea is for the first year they can be exposed to different subjects to certain core ways of thinking and then they can choose do they want to major in economics or history or physics or music and to make it highly interdisciplinary so that students can combine subjects because the space of knowledge is no longer compartmentalized into the traditional disciplines and in that respect higher education has fallen behind the actual growth of knowledge in the way in which higher education is structured the Department of Economics, the Department of History, the Department of Physics, the Department of, you know, School of Engineering. Because if you look at the most impactful ideas that have come from universities around the world in the last few decades, almost all of them are interdisciplinary, involve multiple disciplines. Certainly in the sciences, that's true. In, in health and medicine, it's true. And it's true in law. Because law, by definition, I think, I'm not a lawyer, and so that gives me the liberty to, <laughs> to speculate, but it seems to me the way the Daksha Fellowship is designed, which is an incredibly exciting uh, program, is is a design that recognizes that law is interdisciplinary because you can be involved in policy you can be involved in technology in your case in your program dispute resolution regulation so many different things you can combine I think combining technology and law is a is a good example of being interdisciplinary why should a student who goes to a university have to choose? I want to study law or I want to study technology. It, it can be combined. I want to talk briefly about a specific approach to pedagogy that I wish to encourage. And that, of course, comes from my own field, my own research field, which is cognitive neuroscience how the mind works we have a lot of research now behind us in the field of cognitive neuroscience on how the mind works and how students learn best and I'll be blunt as I think uh, your Dean knows on this subject the pedagogies that have dominated in higher education in the past do not correspond to how the mind learns best okay. 
in other words lecture mugging and then spitting back uh, in an exam okay that that does not do justice to the human brain full stop and the evidence now is overwhelming okay so many universities around the world continue to spin their wheels with that model uh, and uh, the employers continue to be puzzled this is true here in the United States it's certainly true in India the employers by and large are saying the universities are not really preparing the students for what we want them to do we need them to think analytically we need them to communicate effectively we need them to be able to solve problems which by definition means new problems not just uh, textbook kinds of problems we need them to show some leadership and in initiative we need them to know how to work in teams we need them to understand other people so that they can work in teams all of these things that industry is telling us I imagine law firms too we telling us that we need but the universities don't provide that Sai University intends to provide that our goal is to produce leaders and by leader I don't mean the narrow sense of political leader you can be a leader in your field you can be a leader in your community whatever the community is your professional community your social uh, community uh, that's the kind of education that we wish to foster at, at Sai. So the uh, lecture, uh, mugging, rote memorization, final exams model <coughs> is something that we wish to go beyond. Of course, lectures will always play a, an important role. It's a very effective way of communicating, but it shouldn't be the singular way in which information is acquired by students because now you have access to sources and you don't need to receive all of the points of information from your teacher in the classroom the classroom time should maximize the amount of discussion should maximize the opportunity for the professor to really add value in in highlighting the key ideas and getting the students to work on those key ideas uh, those who've heard me speak before know I like to say ideally in every class every student should speak at one point or another communication oral and written communication has been almost completely missing from the Indian education system and particularly in a multilingual country it's all the more important that by the time you start working in your case whether it's a job or uh, you, you set out on your own you have mastered the skill of communicating effectively the ideas that you have have learned otherwise those ideas are stuck in the brain and, and you're not able to really uh, get them across among the other things in the cognitive neuroscience of learning is that <clears throat> we should reduce the amount of information and focus on what are the most important <clears throat> key ideas and work them from different angles with different cases different examples different kinds of perspectives that's another lesson that we've learned from the study of cognitive neuroscience because most information isolated bits of information that you learn will be forgotten it's only if you're using it <clears throat> if you're using it in novel ways say new cases come along and you're using it that's when you really learn so I would uh, move on to say a few more things about uh, 
higher education, some of you may be aware that the Indian government has released a new report called the National uh, Education Policy, NEP 2020. It has been, it has received mixed reviews. My perspective is very clear. I am enthusiastic about it. I think that this is exactly what India needs now. It's not a day too soon. And if it is taken seriously, the new education policy, it could really ignite the tremendous talent that India has. Okay. We all know about India's talent. We all know, you know, it's a country of 1.4 billion with roughly half the country, you know, under the age of 25 or whatever that number is now. That's extraordinary. And we all know, and everybody around the world knows, India is an exporter of talent and of brains. <clears throat> But our universities, I have to say, don't really uh, develop those minds to the extent that the talent would justify. Because the education system has been, as I said, too compartmentalized. You have to decide, do I want to do engineering or do I want to do this? And if you decide engineering, you have to state right up from, from the beginning, okay, mechanical, from beginning to end, four years, and then you go out and very few mechanical engineers are actually working in mechanical engineering. Okay, so what were those four years all about? <clears throat> okay. The system is really designed for uh, an economy of 60, I'd say 60 years ago, when the IITs were first set up, where it was important to do that. But the world is very different. Most undergraduates, uh, do not actually practice in their major discipline. Uh, in uh, Perhaps in law they do. They do not in engineering. Uh, they Almost all Indian graduates go into IT, either IT service or IT products. And if you're an IT service, you don't really do any engineering. It's, 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 you, you might be doing sales and marketing, and uh, uh, um, s service. So the education is disconnected from what people actually do. The brain is so complex and each one of our brains is so unique. As I look at all of the wonderful faces on this screen, every single one of you has a unique set of talents, every single one of you. And you know that. And I think many of you probably do recognize what I'm saying, that society has not necessarily brought out the best in each of you. It has tried to force you into a certain way of thinking, a certain kind of cookie cutter, mass produced product but contrary to what many might think, what, the, what will cause the economy to catch fire in a good way is if all of these unique talents are developed and leveraged and you all go out with the confidence that you can bring something unique to the economy, to society, whether it's in law, in the arts, in the sciences, in technology, in uh, whatever field you may choose. One of the nice things about the new education policy is it encourages flexibility. That's a key so that students might be pushed to do engineering by their parents and realize they really have a great talent in, in the arts. Okay, they should be allowed to switch or to combine them. So mommy and daddy are happy. Okay, they have the engineering, but they also are able to express their artistic side. And there's so many ways to combine them in digital 
digital arts. Let's give you an example. Uh, that's when they are really going to make contributions to society. If they're doing things that they find boring or they find they're not particularly good at or they really want to be thinking about something else, that does not contribute to the economy. So the flexibility uh, to let students find their true calling and then encourage them and give them the, the intellectual resources to develop those talents. And I would encourage you all in the Daksha Fellowship, uh, go where your talents are. Uh, even within the law, you know, Daksha Fellowship is, is a privilege. I would love to take the program. I can't. I'm not, I don't qualify because I don't have a law degree. Darn. But uh, every time <clears throat> Anand talks about it, I think, wow, what a program to transition from a law school, a fairly rigid curriculum, to, to actual society where you can find your role and make your unique contribution. The national education policy calls for multiple entry and multiple exit, almost like a superhighway, <clears throat> so that students can get off and get on at different times. Because education is a lifelong process. It's another myth about education that somehow you package your education in certain periods of life and then you get a stamp and you go out into the world. Knowledge is changing so fast. And uh, while, yes, law uh, has a very strong anchor in tradition, the subjects that you'll be dealing with are also are changing fast, like technology, okay, like the kinds of disputes that you might be handling or the kind of regulation that you, you might be handling. So you have to be agile, mentally agile. You have to learn how to learn. You have to get into the habit of learning. I hope that every single one of you, by the time you graduate, is in the habit of constantly reading new things, of expanding your minds, and uh, of, of leading. The national education policy, of course, it has a section on uh, school education. We won't necessarily talk about that. It also liberates some of the professions from the grip of their regulators. Uh, now, law is not one. <laughs> law is still controlled by the Bar Council. Uh, it, uh, medicine will still be controlled by the Medical Council. Uh, but it does liberate engineering, for example, from the AICTE, which is really controlled the profession, the education with an iron hand. And my uh, prediction is that if the kind of openness and flexibility and uh, orientation towards students following their passions, if that aspect of the new education policy is followed, law education will also be transformed uh, quite naturally. I think it'll become part of the culture. The other thing that the NAP recognizes, which is something that's happening around the world, is no longer is it true that when you get your first job, you spend your entire career at that job and then you retire in that job. For better or worse, that is going to be increasingly rare in all countries because the economies, they go through cycles and they're being disrupted in so many ways. The kind of education a student should receive is the kind in which 
you are ready to switch from one thing to another. Uh, in fact, maybe even uh, eager to do that. The predictions made about around the world, students who, who get degrees today, what they're going to do over the next uh, 30 years, 40 years, in your cases, probably maybe 50 years <laughs> before you retire, is that there'll be at least two changes, uh, maybe more, three different jobs. And, but many of your parents or your grandparents would have been in a world in which you know you got a job and you stuck to your job and you retired in that job. But that's not going to happen. All the more reason why the focus should be on becoming leaders, learning to think independently, and so on. Uh, I'm so impressed with the diversity of students that uh, have been recruited. I look at the wonderful faces, the eager faces. I look at some of the backgrounds, and most importantly, I've been hearing from Anant and others uh, about uh, just how exceptional are the students who have been selected and given this opportunity. I know we will get a chance to get to know each other some more. Uh, consider this really both a privilege and a responsibility. Okay, You have responsibility on your shoulders because you are the inaugural cohort of the Daksha Fellowship and Sai University. And we aspire to nothing short of having the Daksha Fellowship and Sai University be the finest of its kind in the country and highly noted and reputable across the world. So you will be the ambassadors for this program.